Our world is full of the unexplainable. And if history is an open book, all of these amazing tales are right there on display, just waiting for us to explore. Welcome to the Cabinet of Curiosities. TV painter and pop culture icon Bob Ross used to say, We don't make mistakes, just happy little accidents. Artists do it all the time. They start making one thing and the next thing they know, it's become something else entirely. But not every work of art is a happy accident. Sometimes, the artist's original idea can take a sinister, not-so-happy turn. One such artist was Bill Stoneham a painter from Boston who, in 1972, had taken on a contract to create two paintings per month for $200 apiece. After he'd completed some paintings for sale and display, he came up with a new one he called The Hands Resist Him. It was an autobiographical painting of sorts. In it, a young boy in a blue shirt stands before a window where the disembodied hands of other children reach toward him out of the darkness. Beside the boy is a frowning girl doll with empty black eyes. According to Stoneham, the boy in the photo is him, based on a photograph of himself when he was about five years old. The glass separating him from the children's hands is meant to be a barrier between two worlds and his guide, the doll. The painting is deeply moving, and many people who have seen it in person have come away feeling uneasy, even haunted. That's to say nothing of the people who actually interacted directly with it. In 1974, The Hands Resist Him went on display at the Feingarten Gallery in Beverly Hills, California. Henry Seldes, an art critic for the LA Times, reviewed the piece shortly after it went up. Not long after that, character actor John Marley purchased the painting for his home collection. Marley had performed in TV shows and feature films like Hawaii Five-0 and Love Story, but he was best known for waking up next to the severed horse's head in The Godfather. Poor Marley had no idea just how deep he'd gotten himself in this time. Usually, the items behind strange occurrences are cursed in some way. They tend to depict figures who were particularly cruel or died in a horrible fashion. They might be made of a substance not meant to be used in creative endeavors, such as blood or bone. If you search online, you'll even find stories about books bound in human skin. This painting didn't have any of that. The artist is still alive. None of his other paintings were known to have caused pain or even death. But for some reason, the hands resist him had become a cursed object. A few years after Marley purchased the painting, Henry Seldes died of an apparent suicide in his apartment. Not long after that, Feingarten, the owner of the art gallery where the painting had hung, died as well. And Marley? He passed away a few years later from complications due to open-heart surgery. The painting was eventually lost, its whereabouts unknown for almost 30 years. Then, in the year 2000, it was listed for sale in the most unlikely place, eBay. The family who had found it behind a California brewery decided to make a few dollars off their luck on an up-and-coming auction website. Their luck, however, hadn't been as fortunate as they'd thought. According to the original listing, the family's four-year-old daughter had complained of fighting during the night. Not between anyone in the house. They were all asleep. She meant between the boy and the doll in the painting. She also said they were coming into her room at night while she was sleeping. The girl's story was so convincing that her father set up a motion sensor in her room to prove to her that it was just her imagination playing tricks on her. Instead, the sensors caught the unexplainable. The doll in the painting had shoved the boy out and onto the floor. Thankfully, their eBay experiment worked. Someone purchased the painting for a fraction of what many collectors would have paid to have it in their own collections. After that, The painting even found its way into a novel published in 2016. While the story itself is fiction, its author, Darren O'Neill, did have his own run-in with the painting. He first came across it online while living in Dubai, where he printed out a copy of it, along with some other unrelated documents, before leaving for a month-long trip to Italy. While he was away, the air conditioning in his home malfunctioned, and the heat 
combined with the moisture, allowed green mold to grow over all the walls and furniture. The clothes in his closet, his daughter's belongings, and the documents he had printed out had all been ruined by the infestation. But not everything had been destroyed. One item survived without a speck of mold on it. His printout of the hands resist him. World War I, also known as the Great War, claimed the lives of 40 million civilians and military personnel from all over the world. It lasted for four years and was commonly referred to as the War to End All Wars. Obviously, that name didn't stick for too long, but it was a particularly brutal and devastating event in world history. The United States stayed out of the fray for most of the war until 1917, when it joined Britain, France, and Russia. Together, these allies combated the Central Powers from Germany, the Austrian-Hungarian Empire, the Ottoman Empire, and Bulgaria all across Europe. World War I saw the rise and fall of some pretty prominent individuals. Woodrow Wilson, Winston Churchill, Tsar Nicholas II, and Vladimir Lenin all made headlines throughout those tumultuous four years. But there was one name that kind of slipped under the radar, which was actually invented during World War II, but let's not get technical, okay? He was known as Sergeant Stubby, and he was from Connecticut. He liked to hang around the Yale University campus, which was where members of the 102nd Infantry trained for their eventual deployment. He and another soldier, Corporal Robert Conroy, had struck up a friendship, and not wanting to wish his best friend goodbye for possibly the last time, Stubby snuck on board Conroy's ship before it set off for France. He was soon discovered, but charmed the infantry's commanding officer and was allowed to stay, much to everyone's surprise. Stubby found himself in the trenches for eight months alongside his new family, including Conroy. He began his military career in early February of 1918 and never shied away from battle, quickly getting used to the constant barrage of gunfire exploding overhead day and night. Three months later, Stubby was wounded in the leg by a German hand grenade and spent weeks at the rear recovering. With two new wound stripes on his uniform, he was back at the front lines helping his regiment. He learned how to detect mustard gas to warn his unit, and he was the only soldier capable of finding wounded troops in No Man's Land without getting shot. No Man's Land was an uncrossable stretch of terrain between two enemy trenches. Anyone who tried to cross it was almost instantly killed, but not Stubby. During another battle in Argonne, Stubby had come across a German spy and held him captive until reinforcements arrived to take the enemy away. By the end of the war, Sergeant Stubby had fought in four major offenses and 17 battles, and became a bit of a celebrity back home. The military and numerous other organizations awarded him three service stripes, a Yankee Division YD patch, a Purple Heart, a New Haven World War I Veterans Medal, and seven other honors. He marched in a number of victory parades, and even went on to meet President Woodrow Wilson. Stubby had demonstrated his abilities as a new breed of soldier. I don't mean he was more ruthless or cunning than the others. He was literally a new breed of soldier. A mixture of Boston and American Bull Terrier, to be specific. Sergeant Stubby was Corporal Conroy's dog. In 1921, Conroy swapped the front lines for Georgetown University, where he received his law degree, with Stubby by his side. The Mutt soon became the university's mascot and made appearances at football games, running around the field at halftime to entertain the fans. Stubby had lived a full and rewarding life, more so than any other dog, and he'd been rewarded handsomely for his service. After his death in 1926, the New York Times ran a half-page obituary for him, longer than any that most of his human contemporaries had received. And if you visit Washington, D.C., Stop by the National Museum at the Smithsonian, where you'll find Stubby on display in his military uniform, adorned with his many medals. Corporal Conroy donated Stubby's taxidermied remains to the facility in 1956. Dogs are loyal, faithful companions. 
They have a keen intuition and know when we're sick or sad or even in danger. They will protect us, as Sergeant Stubby did for the 102nd Infantry, and as many dogs do for today's soldiers. Stubby never asked to be a hero, but he certainly became one simply by being Conroy's friend. You might even say that he was that man's best friend. I hope you've enjoyed today's guided tour of the Cabinet of Curiosities. Subscribe for free on Apple Podcasts or learn more about the show by visiting curiositiespodcast.com. This show was created by me, Aaron Mankey, in partnership with How Stuff Works. I make another award-winning show called Lore, which is a podcast, book series, and television show. And you can learn all about it over at theworldoflore.com. And until next time, stay curious. Stay curious.